Sam, good to see you. Hey, good morning. We're about to uh, commence our worship and I wanted to give you a couple notes so that you can flow along with us. It's gonna be a little different this week in that we're going to have uh, video clips stitched into this of different readers and prayers and the sermon's been done at a separate time just to give you some variation rather than just the framed uh, sanctuary part of the church. I hope you are able to be encouraged and enjoy that. Before we begin in the posture that we enter in, I want you to think about something. The change in our hearts, perspective and outlook and how we feel and think about what's going on from two weeks ago to last week to this week as we anticipate going to level two. There's a new hope and a new resurgence and a new uh, anticipation returning. And today is VE Day. And I think and have read about those days they experienced. And some of our people in our church actually remember. Some were actually serving at the time. I think of Vic, who was in the RAF, or Howie, who was in one of the foot guard regiments deployed in some horrible place in those days before the war was concluded. It wasn't quite yet, but it was coming. And that's the time we are in right now. And we will get to celebrate as they did on VE Day soon. Now, I'm quite aware that come next week, there will be some people who will not yet be able to enjoy um, being together in this room with us. But hopefully they are able to stay in that anticipation of the very soon coming day when they can rejoin us and we can all be together. So um, we're going to pause for just a moment and then we're going to begin our worship. I was just thinking, it's like, how do you begin a service when you're in a building by yourself? But this is a place where the processional, where the beginning gathering song that calls us all in would be. So if you want to play that processional, you can do that now and uh, we will begin. So we pause for a second to let all the distractors go turn off the phone, turn off the oven, sit down, be quiet, and let's prepare ourselves to be in God's presence together. Loving God, we begin this time of worship together and we celebrate being with you. And even in this isolation yet, we are able to be together through uh, the technology and our shared effort and intent to participate in this with one another. In all of our worship and reflection, we do in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Hopefully you have got the order of worship and you can interact with us as we go through this and um, we'll be able to enjoy it as one stream of worship together. So let's gather. Grace and peace to you from God. God fill us with truth and joy. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So here is the formal greeting for God. Kite atua tina kwe, and to you, kia kaha, kia maya, kia mana wanui. Let us be strong, let us have courage, and be patient, and here kitua. Hold on, better times are coming. So today, as we uh, worship, I, I do want to take a moment and acknowledge that it's Mother's Day. And I lament that we're not able to be here and celebrate. So if you are a mom, if you are anticipating being a mom, if you are a grandparent, we acknowledge you and celebrate you on this day. And all of us are either sons or daughters or grandsons or granddaughters of someone. And I know that you will be in contact with um, those special women in your life and acknowledge them. And I hope that even in our... Um, still yet limited life of isolation, we're able to celebrate, though not as we normally like to. 
But you know, it's, it's actually a very hard thing for a pastor or a priest to do on a Mother's Day and a Father's Day, and I think even more on a Mother's Day, is to genuinely celebrate Mother's Day, but yet acknowledge there's people who have lost children and there's people who've not been able to have children and there's people who have estranged relationships and our more scattered geographic society that we have today, it's harder as well. So I want to acknowledge and hold in tension the great joy and let that be the framing uh, thought and, and posture that we take for today, Mother's Day. But I also want to acknowledge that because it is so special, those who have had it less than perfect, I, I recognize that, that sadness that, that is also present. And one of the things that uh, I was thinking about for this week was what's the appropriate way to mark this transitional week it is. Because next week, we're anticipating a lot of us going to be in this room together. We're going to do it together so that we have the strength and the unity because not everybody can be with us. So the ones that can be together, we'll do in one service and that we will be able to actually live stream it on the internet. And we'll be sending you information about how you can watch that. So that if you were one of the people who are vulnerable and can't be with us next week, you'll be able to watch it live in this room and be able to hear and participate with us at the very same time while you're at home. But this week is Psalm, and I chose Psalm 26 for this transitional week out of this experience we've had. And it's one of the Psalms of Ascent. It's actually one of the very last Psalms of Ascent in Psalm. The 126th Psalm is one of the Psalms of Ascent that they would sing as they reached the gates of the city and went straight upon arrival, straight to the temple. And it is a song that remembers the hope that they had lost being captives in Babylon and how they just couldn't believe the reality of being able to be a people again. And they recalled and remembered that three times a year as the pilgrims gathered in Jerusalem. So if you would read along with me there, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, Yahweh has done great things for them. Yahweh has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Yahweh, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing will come home with shouts of joy, bringing their sheaves with them. So now I give you an invitation to enter into our worship. Hear the commandment of Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Spirit of God, search our hearts. So I give you an invitation to confession. We obey that command to confess our sins to God and to one another. And the scripture tells us that he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us of every kind of wrong. In silence, we call to mind our sins. Let us confess our sins. Together we pray. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Savior Christ's sake, and renew, and renew our, our lives, lives to, the to the glory of, of your name. name. Amen. Amen. So knowing that we are not separated from God, knowing that God's grace has already forgiven us and sealed us eternally, we reconcile the relationship and renew it. And therefore, I announce what is already true to you. 
that through the cross of Christ, God has forgiven you and has mercy on you and has set you free. Know that you're forgiven and be at peace. God strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Amen. The peace of Christ rule in our hearts. The word, word of Christ, Christ dwell in us richly. So now we come to the part where we do the peace and obviously we can't do that together. But our intent, our intent, our heart, our prayer, our posture, our agreement with God, our unity in our posture comes through our words that we profess together. The peace of Christ be always with you and, and also with, with you. you. At Tefano, we are the body of Christ. By, By one spirit, spirit we, we were, were baptized, baptized into, into one body. body. So we keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Amen. Amen. We, we are, are bound, bound by, by the love, love of, of Christ. Christ. So I give you a moment here to ensure that we are at peace with one another. And if there's any work you need to do for, to forgive someone else that, that wasn't done before the absolution, I, I offer you this moment to do that. And that maybe you not only express love and peace with those that are with you right now, but that maybe you jot down a few names of people you're going to call today and just bless them with the peace and unity that we have. Maybe somebody who can't even access the internet in our church. Did you know there's like 30 who can't, who have no access to our internet ability to do this, They just but they do have phones and it would be great to give them a ring. Here is where we've um, put into the order of worship uh, a song that kind of unites us and reunites us. It would be the song where we regather from expressing the peace to one another and it's blessed assurance and it's a, a beautiful arrangement. And we continue with the sentence for today, this thought that frames our whole worship. Jesus said to his disciples, the spirit alone gives eternal life. What I have spoken to you brings God's life-giving spirit. So together we pray this collect prayer together. Bountiful and loving God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and live according to it, that we may grow in faith and hope and love and proclaim with courage and conviction your unfailing promises of unconditional love and acceptance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns in unity with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So now we're going to turn to our readings, God's Word, and they're going to be two. The first one offered to you by Rowena Stevens, and the second one by Grant Moore. We pause now and listen to God's Word. Reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. The cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were travelling with Jesus, and turning to them he said, If anyone comes after me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build but wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able, with 10,000 men, to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegate, while the other is still a long way off, and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? 
It is fit neither for the soil nor the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. And now we turn to our gospel reading. And the reading is from St. Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Praise and glory to God. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people who were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or perception comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times what was sown. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ the, the word. word. It's kind of cool to be able to stitch these different videos together and bring one fluid service and to have others involved in what we're doing. I uh, express my thanks to both of you for doing that, producing that and getting that to me this week. But we respond to God's word in our creed and we profess our faith saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. So now we'll pause for just a moment and then enter straight into the sermon. As we move to our teaching, I want to give you a bit of a frame for it. You just heard our readers give us both readings, and we're going to spend some time in those texts. And it's part 13 and 14. It's been a long journey through this follow the rabbi. We've had uh, Palm Sunday and Easter, and we've had uh, Dave Elliott bring us a message outside of our series. You know when you go on the long haul trip and you have the little screen and you can switch back and forth from watching a movie 
or listen to music or a television program or a TED talk, you can switch over and check where you are in the journey. These are for those long haul flights when you're flying over a lot of ocean and you can think, oh, I've got so far. But then as you get closer, you can start zeroing in, but then you can back up and see the whole journey again. That's what I want to do first. Now, look, today's teaching, um, I hope you'll open the manuscript version. The manuscript version is going to give you a lot more detail than we can get into. It's also going to clarify some points. But the disclaimer up front is that it's not perfect. Uh, it's Friday evening when I'm recording this and there's just no more time to, to edit that document. But I think it's good enough that hopefully it'll be helpful for you. And you can use it as we move along or refer to it afterwards. So looking at our journey, like you would on that aeroplane, um, let me recap it. The first 12 weeks, week one, how rabbis made Talmudim, disciples, how Jesus chose and formed those disciples. Week two, they operated with a passion and a reckless commitment to follow their rabbi, to be like their rabbi. The third week, how do we actually go about doing that? What does that begin to look like? The fourth week was that week we had baptisms in our services, in each service. And you saw how a covenant, a very rounded, holistic covenant is made between the person being baptized and their family, the person being baptized and the church, the family to the person, the church to the person, and then the priest standing there as the agent, the presence, making the statement of covenant that God makes with us in baptism, but relating that also to the completion of that covenant that takes place of the person to the church in confirmation. And how that's also relevant in a funeral or a wedding or an ordination. And how this is very normal of God making these series of covenants with his people. And that's part of being a disciple. The fifth week, you remember this one. I hate evangelism and I feel guilty. And we talked about how it's not a, uh, a dispensation of information, but it's a relationship in the, the holding relationship bowl it's the context for them coming to understand and perceive and taste who is this Jesus and coming to know and follow him. Week six was about leveraging and scaling that to make disciples, you've got to grow people up in the faith and you've got to raise up leaders. And that's done through apprenticing. Week seven was about unity and how division is destructive and Eric taught that week, if you remember. Week eight was about discipleship in the real world. We had the pandemic coming. And the concept was that it's not by accident. That in such a time as this, you are being sent to your family and your friends and your neighbors. And even in isolation, rather than operating out of fear, rather than just surviving that, in the rarest time in the past 80 years, we've got an opportunity to speak into lives like never before when everything that made life work doesn't work anymore the way it used to and should. We've got a voice and something to say in a way, if we live it out selflessly, that could see people come to know him that haven't. Week nine was about being a disciple and discerning the Spirit's voice. And week 10 was kind of the continuation of that spirit, how we could pragmatically co-labor with the spirit and discern what he's doing as we live out our faith. And then weeks 11 and 12 were on hospitality and they had different angles. One was being hospitable and what that could look like. And last week was what is it we're trying to do in, hosp in hospitality? This is as an individual, in a life group, as a ministry, or as a church or the church. What does it look like and what is it we're trying to do? And the whole focus of last week was we are trying to create space where people can be drawn out because they come to taste and see that they are loved and they do belong and we are committed to them. And then today, it's kind of about perspective, about getting out from the trees and getting up to the level where we can see the forest. Let's pray. 
Loving God, be our teacher. Open up our word. Open our hearts so that we might be inspired and filled with joy as we come out of this COVID-19 experience. Loving God, Holy Spirit, may we not be and return to who we were, but we will have grown and matured and expanded and transformed and opened in ways that we could not have been without this journey. Would you speak to us now in your word? In Jesus' name, amen. You know, amen. You know when you've done a project, maybe you were following a pattern and making an article of clothing. Maybe you're doing a DIY project. Maybe it's a recipe. Maybe it's a school project. Maybe it's a work project. And you get so far into it, no matter what any of those are, and you find out it's too short. It's too long. We don't have enough money. We were focused on the wrong thing. We should have been focused on this. We've got to back up and redo this. And that quite often will bring about a couple of colorful adjectives, but it'll cause us to be frustrated and to walk off and to come back and we've got to undo things. But with some time and probably some more money, we can fix it and go on. But you can't do that with the church. You've heard me say, if we aim at nothing, we'll hit it at every time. The church doesn't exist to exist and plot along. Christians don't just exist to wait, to die, to be in heaven. That we actually have a purpose and something for us to do. Now, you know that. You know that. But in making disciples, we got to do it on purpose. And the efforts that we make have to be on purpose. Anybody ever grow tomatoes? You know, the little laterals? It's like you have the branch breaking off and they grow right in the middle there, except these little runners suck all this energy from the plant, but they never create fruit. So you, you pinch them off when they're little or cut them off if you find them later. The church has to be intentional. And if we're not, it costs. In the early church, it grew in Palestine and Asia Minor and North Africa rather quickly, actually. And it spread across the Roman Empire, even. And yet today, the church is almost gone from the Middle East. It, it's a remnant in Palestine. It's hardly anywhere in Egypt, once the center of the church. You go east towards India, where some of the disciples went, and it's almost gone. You go to Europe once the center of Christendom, and it's a mere shell. The church can lose its way. The candle can be blown out. It can become ineffective. But it doesn't have to be that way. When I think of today in New Zealand, in the church of who we are and what we're doing. You look at churches like Grace Vineyard here in Christ Church or the street in Wellington or St. Paul Simon Street in Auckland, one of our own Anglican churches. Yeah, it's harder in post-Christendom to bring the gospel to people. But it can be done. And the Spirit is moving and the Spirit will co-labor and partner with God's people in the church to reach souls. That used to be St. Christopher's, didn't it? But we're not seeing a lot of people, not a lot of people come to faith. Not a lot of people growing up in their faith. Not a lot of people stepping up. Not a lot of people. But yet, this is a church that, how many priests in the past 20 years have come out of this church? How many leaders has it launched that are in multiple places now? How many people did I know in Wellington who came from this church? It's reputation in Auckland. Its reputation in Nelson of such an effective church. My exhortation and whole message is we, we need to be smart about how we do our recipe, our DIY, our work project, so that we actually are effective. We need to get up above the tree so we can see the forest. This is a great church. And I think God wants to tell us something in his word. Now we heard Rowena bring us Luke 14. 
That was the three times, if you want to be my disciple, you have to hate your whole family, you have to carry your cross, and count the cost before you do it. So before you sign up, know what you're getting into. Now, I want you to grab a couple aspects of the triple repeat that Jesus does here. First of all, rabbis often spoke in hyperbole. When they spoke in hyperbole, including Jesus here, he's not actually wanting us to hate our families. This was a rabbinic way of saying, there's no mitigating this. There's no minimizing this. I'm dead serious about this. Don't try to excuse it away. If you want to be my disciple, it's first priority. If you want to be my disciple, you've got to carry your cross. It will cost you. You've got to lay some things down. You've got to make bandwidth and priority and make it first priority in your life. You can't live in two kingdoms and two worlds. One God, one Lord. No convert and adherent, but disciples. And then the third one, count the cost. If you really want to be a Christian, you don't just become a minimal adherent, a little bit of Christian. You know, I always think of that hatch, match, and dispatch, which is a comic way of saying that Christians you only see at Christmas and Easter in baptisms and weddings and funerals. Jesus says, that's not a disciple. That's not a Christian. Religious, but not a Jesus follower. And if you are a Christian, you're a Jesus follower. So count the cost before you do it. Now, a little side com- comedic moment. That tower he's referring to was a current news, real world situation. And whoever had done it and run out of money was actually being laughed at by the locals. So when Jesus said that, he had a smirk in the the corner of his mouth. And he was actually making a, a pretty relevant point to their situation. When we think about education, education is no longer rote learning. No more dispensing information that you pack into your head. There's too much information. 20 years ago, information was doubling every 18 months. And now it's just exponentially greater. They don't try to teach you by packing in masses of information. They give you some core knowledge about any topic. And then you learn how to access and integrate and use that information. So when I think about that passage in Luke, about if you want to be my disciple, there's some questions that I want to leave with you from this section. To what are we discipling and forming and raising Christians to? Are we actually calling them to a gospel of following Jesus or are we giving them a cultural interpretation of add Jesus on like manual or electric windows? For a little bit more, you can add on electric windows, make your car nicer. Who are we to be if we are to be Jesus followers who count the cost and are sold out? What are the implications for us in how we do children's and youth and adult and evangelism? What are the implications for what we teach and preach, what I'm doing right now? What does it mean for the formation of leaders? How can we form and live in communities and not just dispense information, but doing it in a way that is like we had earlier in the series, and Jesus is talking about here, an apprenticing method where there is information given, but then an action reflection, which you'll see in the next passage, you participate in it, and then you do some learning, and then you apply and move on, but you're in a learning community of people that are learning and growing together, sharing all of life, committed to the same journey, and the learning grows. This is how the best way to make leaders. This is the best way to disciple. This is the best way to evangelize. It's the best way to be the church. So if we're going to do church on purpose, so we don't cut it too short or too long or run out of money or study the wrong thing, so we don't aim at nothing and hitting every time, so that we do church on purpose, what are the implications for us? Our second passage from St. Mark. And you heard Grant read this passage a little bit longer passage, but it's one that's so familiar, even to people who haven't been to church, four different soils. The problem is we look at it with pre-digested eyes, and we think it is purely about who we tell the gospel to, or the person's responsibility to make sure they're good soil and not rocky soil, and how they receive what God's telling them. Good applications, but actually rather narrow. And I want to take it a little bit bigger and give it some perspective. 
in this context, Jesus, it tells us that he's in Galilee, bigger context if you read before, and he has a large crowd and he gets in a boat. Now I can see it. You're in a cove. The crowds are too big. The land's rather flat. He gets in a boat. A lot of people can see him. The weather would have been good for them to be able to hear him. And he begins to teach them. He uses terms that everybody there would have understood. These agrarian terms. They understood the four different ways seed fall and how they farmed at that time. It's actually not really hard to get the metaphorical meanings he's talking about. But these young disciples in a very Talmudine rabbinic format afterwards want to interact with him and they want to make sure they got the point. So Jesus unpacks it for them. And there's some interesting conversations that come out in that conversation. When you look at Mark 4, you get the four soils, path, hard packed, birds come along and take it, rocky soil, no depth for the root system, the harsh sun comes and burns it up. The weeds and the thorns get choke out the seed as it becomes a young plant. And then finally, the good soil and the harvest. Now, it's got the evangelistic response or how we communicate in there. But it doesn't tell us some other things about forming and shaping that are applicable for us. When you get further down to verse 10, it says, when he was alone, they asked him. And when Jesus says, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom and everybody else, it's in parables. This is just normal rabbinic teaching. So, okay, I told it to everybody. They're not going to completely get it. Now I'm going to unpack it for you. They were used to this conversation. They often would ask questions and Jesus would answer in questions. That wasn't Jesus being coy. It was a question was answered with a question which they would wrestle in process and then ask another question to take it deeper. Pretty common way of doing it. Great way of learning. And so he unpacks it for them. And he talks about these priorities. And he gets down to talking about, do you not understand the parable? Do you not? Un- How then will you understand all the parables? He's telling them, this is a rabbinic way of teaching. You know how to do this. And he tells them that the ones along the path where the word is sown. Now, the word there is logos, the truth about God. Don't get hung up on English translations when we're distanced by language and cultural and experience and perspective on the world. But there's a logos to be communicated to people. We do it within our language and our context and culture. But quite often our culture can interpret and embrace things the wrong way. We watch the United States right now, really angry over individual freedoms and coming out of this isolation experience. And they're a few days ahead of us in that isolation. Their frustrations are rising. We're seeing the frustrations rise in New Zealand. In the United States, it's even getting much worse. And they confuse that individuality and my rights and freedom is being God given which is actually a Western post-enlightenment, humanistic, individual, I am the God of my life and decide, not actually a biblical perspective. A biblical perspective is others first, me last. So our cultural understanding of how we approach things can color it. And he says, Satan takes that logos and he takes it away because it never really had any grounding. And then the rocky soil and... There's no root and then the weeds. And I want to unpack that a little bit. First, the hard soil. Our work is not just to do social work, not just to do community work, not just to have effective programming, not just to convey information. But this is a spiritual war and souls are at stake. So when we communicate the gospel, we need to communicate it clearly and wholly, holistically. We need to make sure that people understand that following Jesus is a surrendering and a changing kingdoms. And that what it is to be an ordinary Christian and to love people and serve him with our whole life, not oppressively, not laboriously, not exhaustingly. Remember, he said, my yoke is easy. And if you don't even know what that means to do that holistically and enjoy and with a light yoke, then there's some discipleship that we need to do. 
But Satan steals it away. You know, we went through an era where people said, I'm going to let my children choose and I'm not going to force God upon them. That actually is a very humanist way of thinking. That's not a biblical way of thinking. A biblical way of thinking is I'll teach my children the way they should go. I'll rise up and I'll put their word on their mouth and in their hearts. And I'll remind them day by day. The reality is in a post-Christian culture that if you're not discipling your kids, if we don't disciple our kids, the world is discipling them every day. And they just get a false narrative. So that hard soil where Satan steals it away We've got to disciple them wholly and honestly and true and not put seed on hard soil. We've got to create the good soil that where it can root in. More on that in a moment. The rocky soil where it gets choked out. That basically means there's no good root system. If it gets choked out and doesn't live past the early stage, that's a plant in the crack in the concrete with just a little bit of dirt. You see, our good coastal hardy kiwi plants have something to teach us. They have really deep, hard roots. That Scottish gorse that came in here, a little plant this tall will have roots this deep. They root in and nothing, the wind and the weather, even drought, because the root taps down so deep to seek that moisture, is going to destroy that plant. But a plant without a good root system dries up and gets burned up and doesn't make it when the wind in the weather, and the heat come along. That's an exhortation that in the church, as we evangelize, as we disciple, as we grow as a church, we need to grow up in our faith. We need to develop a good deep root system, not just give people little bumper sticker forms of theology, not just little, just the basics. A very experienced guy in the church, older than me, told me a couple of years ago, you have to remember in our church, And he meant the Anglican church, the whole church in New Zealand, that the theological depth on whole is about Alpha. You know the Alpha program? It's pretty much the barest minimum basics of what it is to know and understand and follow God. The third area, the weeds and the thorns. This is the distractors. You know, fish who swim in water contaminated with arsenic end up having arsenic in their bodies and in the fish that we would then eat. We are fish swimming in a cultural water that colors us and it disciples us 24-7 and shapes our, our education system and our social value system in the things that we promote and talk about and you see on the news and what we value and reinforced over and over and over colors how we see the world and not always the way God tells us it really is. They distract us and consume us with things that don't matter. You remember the passage. Where your heart is, your treasure will be. And and invest your treasure in things that are eternal and don't rust and the moth doesn't get. Not in these things that do waste away. And the world has us chasing some things that don't matter. And I think that's one of the amazing things about this COVID experience. Is it's really cleared the deck of a bunch of stuff that, hmm, that doesn't really matter. I've really spent a lot of my energy and my emotional energy on things that don't matter. Affluenza in a first world gets in a way of having this, of achieving this, of being respected to this, of accumulating this, of getting away to the house, of doing sport on Sunday, of going to the beach, of going to, in the priority of God and being God's people together becomes less and less and less. And with six months and a year and two years and five years, people who are distracted with affluenza and the distractors of what our society says, all of a sudden they're not following God and they're not raising their people up to follow God. And then there's a good soil. You know, if you're going to raise a plant in a pot or in the ground, you know what it needs. It needs that right biosphere. The right amount of sunlight for that plant. The right amount of moisture for that plant. In the right times. Not just all at once and then none. The right temperatures. The right nutrients. The right funguses and microbial actions taking place in the dirt. The right worms and other little tiny animals that create a healthy environment. The right husbandry by us on our plants to help them flourish. And produce and grow and be their best 
so that they don't just limp along. That's what we do for a plant. And the idea here is that that's what you do with a soul, be it evangelism or discipleship or your own pursuit of God, is that you make sure you place yourself in good soil. You make sure you create the right biosphere for those you are bringing along and discipling in the faith, for those that you're responsible for, for those that you bring them to Jesus. That we don't just interpret the gospel as grabbing hold of some information or ascribing to a few truths. Now look, quickly, there's some hindrances. Most of them have to do with fear. One fear is, and we face this in the Anglican church big time, a fear of being acceptable and respected by society and the world. Now on some things that's good, right? Hunger, housing, need, war, climate change, um, uh, any number of feeding the, the hungry. All of these things are important and the world will respect us. In fact, they want us to actually be like Jesus in those areas. But in a lot of ways, society has pressured the church to prove itself and be acceptable. And we have felt it necessary emotionally to be accepted and approved of by society in our message. And it tells us here in this scripture, in this Mark passage, at the world, or the Luke passage, if you stand back from these two passages, the world's not going to be really excited about our message. It's not going to be excited. It doesn't understand why Jesus is the only way. These others may be sincere. They may actually be earnest. But why is Jesus exclusive? They're not going to buy that. They're going to reject it. I was communicating with a Christian in Wellington a couple days ago who was a universalist. Then my answer was, so as long as I'm sincere then where does Jesus' sacrifice fit in here? He died for nothing because you just got to be sincere. So basically, you become an agent in your own salvation. Jesus isn't a savior at all. And that's heresy. He's never been formed and discipled. So what kind of environment do we do? What do we do on purpose as a church? What do we do that helps people systemically move along? Now, as we're coming out of this COVID thing, what do we stop and what do we start? What do we retool and repurpose and refocus so that it can be effective again? How do we structure our children's ministry so it flows into youth ministry, into adults? How do we raise people up? How do our life groups go from just being holy huddles, which all of the warmth and support and encouragement we keep, but we also have our eyes up to make disciples of people who already know him and people who are on the way to him. And the world's not going to approve of that. They just want us to do good social work. Dispensation of information. A second hindrance to making disciples. Fear. Fear of failure. Fear of rejection. Fear that we're going to be laughed at with the person we're trying to love to Jesus. Fear of failure that I don't know what I'm doing. Fear of getting it wrong or them not being responsive. Fear of not knowing how to do this. I'm going to talk about that in a second. The response to these fears of not being accepted, of rejection, of failure, of not being successful, of not knowing what to do, of focusing on the wrong person. Here's the encouragement. For yourself, it's about your heart. You become a disciple and seek God. If you don't, if you've never been discipled, then get somebody to disciple you. We've got a lot of people mature in their faith around here. All these great people in the vestry team, all these other ministry leaders, people in different ministries. And I suspect the one through whom God will work is someone you already have relationship with. It may be somebody that you just feel led to start a relationship, but ask and seek God and pray and let his word work. You know that when it comes to the rejection, where's your treasure? Invest in it. Give it a go. Don't worry about failing. Experiment. If you say it and you get it wrong and you got to back up and say, hey, what I told you last week, you know what I've been learning, what I hear God saying and what I've kind of wrestled through with someone and redo it. When it comes to biblical knowledge, there's good stuff out there. There's a lot of rubbish out there, too. There's some really good books. There's some bad books. There's some good stuff on the net and there's some uh, there's stuff that's really helpful. 
Come to us, ask us, ask the best respected leaders and they'll guide you to who and where to get better grounded in God's word. But I want to encourage you that you just don't go do a course online, but that you have an action reflection and you live life with others in the trenches of following Jesus together and loving people to Jesus together. When it comes to making sure you put the right seed in the right places. A lot of people say you go for the low-hanging fruit, those who are responsive and ready to hear God's word, or the one who's not ready to hear God's word, but is drawn to you or you feel called to go to. You discern that with God, and then you invest yourself in that person or a couple of people. But if each of us just had one or two people, if each life group just had one or two couples or families, that they, over several years, spent time with, we'd see more people come to know him, more than we are now. If we maybe altered this ministry, stop that one because it's life and energy and time has come to close. But we need to start this because we've got a gap. Or the Spirit is leading you to invest in this. Then let's be responsive. Let's get up among the trees and let's be intentional as a church, as each ministry, how each ministry fits in the church, how each life group underpins these ministries, and how each of us follows Jesus as individuals and as a group. You know, we're going to be doing seminars that help people on a journey. I call them adult, mainly musics. One will be Life Beyond Noodles for young adults. Another one will be parenting seminars. And then in the future, seminars for teens. I used to do these seminars for parents of teens, and my mantra was parenting is a contact sport. It doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It's very intentional and thought through. It's purposed. You do it on purpose. Kodak moments do just happen, but they happen because you're intentional to create the biosphere and the space for them to happen. They're in the context of a relationship as you journey through life and you action reflection as they experience things, as you raise them up. And it's the same thing with the church. Being a disciple, being a church. And the environment we create for those people. So I want to create some silence here and I'll pray in a minute where you reflect on all I just said. Recapping soil. If you want to be my disciple, being intentional as a church and how we love people to Jesus, creating those spaces and those relationships that we need to grow up on our faith and be plants with deep root systems. And we need to make disciples and grow others up in their faith. And maybe we just go together because we don't have anybody to disciple us, but we need good resources to guide us. And what program ministry do we start and stop? I think God's got a lot to say for us. And it's probably in God's timing, perfect timing, that this message is right now because we weren't ready to hear it. We couldn't hear it when we were in the white noise humming of our life going on before. But now that we've been forced to a space to be still where there's been more bandwidth to hear God and the things that distract us, the white noise hum has been stripped away. We see, hear, perceive. And what comes up out of our, our heart is very unique and it's actually the right time to hear this stuff. So I'm going to let you reflect now. Loving God, be our teacher. Birth forth green shoots in this season of the past years, in the season of the past year, of the season of the past two months. May we see green shoots of hope, early flowers, new areas, new ways. May we make disciples, connecting with the right people, investing in the right people, creating the belonging, drawing them out and speaking into to help them come to know the real you, 
not a perceived, not a redacted, smaller version of you, not a you that we're comfortable with, but the real you. May we present the real whole gospel. May we bring people to fall in love with you and grow deep root systems in their faith and their understanding of you and what it is to live in relationship with you and each other as the church. Help us as groups of friends, as life groups, as ministries, and as a church to hear what you're doing and saying so that we can row in unison. You as our coxswain, as we row together, not banging our oars, but all working together, co-laboring with you as we sail this ship into open waters, as we are responsive to your spirit that people may come to know you. Bless our hearts and our minds and leave us inspired and excited about the future. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope the teaching this week encourages you and frames us and gives us perspective to live our lives and to be the church and to organize and function what we do as individual saints, as life groups, as ministries, and as a whole church to do it on purpose and intentionally, and that we organize all of our energies and efforts and resources of time and money and people around who we're called to be. So now we turn from the word to prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is our privilege to pray for your world and your people. We thank you for the beauty of your world and the places of recreation it provides. We are blessed to have had this time to see it more clearly and to have more time to enjoy its intricacies. As we listen to the reading from Luke, we are reminded of our farmers and fishermen and are grateful for their caretaking of land and sea. Guide them to make wise decisions as they work these environments to provide for us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Faithful God, we pray for your church, both here and across the world, as it continues to bring love and assurance amid our chaos and isolation. We give thanks for Bishop Peter and our leaders here at St Christopher's as they work to keep us connected and to encourage us in our faith. May we all be inspired by your word to pray, to love and to serve our communities. We ask for your blessing and protection for those serving you in mission and overseas at this time. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Loving God, on this Mother's Day, we remember our mothers who have cherished and nurtured us and we give thanks for the part that they have played in our lives. We celebrate all mothers among us and in our community. We ask that you give strength and patience to all those who struggle with small children or difficult teenagers. In this time of social restriction, we ask you to comfort and reassure those who are unable to hug or visit their families. Give an inner peace to those to whom motherhood brings much heartache and grief. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Healing God, we give thanks for all those who have worked tirelessly to bring us to a more hopeful COVID situation. Protect those who are returning to workplaces and encourage them in times of fear or, un or uncertainty. 
Give them strength and endurance and help them to have times of relaxation and recovery. We bring before you all those who we know who are unwell, for those who are very lonely and frightened of the future, those who are not sure if their jobs and livelihoods will survive, those who are struggling to feed their families or themselves. Surround them with your love. Give them peace in their hearts and the strength to continue, confident that you are journeying alongside each step of their way. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those who have died and for their loved ones who are unable to come together to remember them at this time. Help them as they grieve and give them the reassurance that those they love will not be forgotten. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord God, our Saviour, be with us all as we continue to distance socially. Help us to use our time wisely, to be good neighbours, to be creative, and to find joy in each day and in each other. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we close our prayer time with the Lord's Prayer. And you have two links for it in Tereo Māori and in English in a sung version. And we'll do the spoken version together now. So we pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And this is where we would normally do our offertory. And we do have a song uh, link there in your order of worship that you can listen to. And as you choose to listen to that, I want you to note that it was filmed and recorded for a television program, but it was done at the Cathedral of the Diocese of Coventry. And Coventry's cathedral was bombed not for any industrial wartime effort, but purely out of meanness that the old city center was bombed and its cathedral was destroyed. And if you're to travel to Coventry today, you would see the shell of the old cathedral left there and a new cathedral built about 15 years later that stands next to it, expressing the grief of the past and the hope of today and the future. And so I hope that you will enjoy that song uh, through all the changing scenes of life. But it's a great opportunity for us to pause and offer to God our offerings. And that's it's a little strange because most of us do it electronically and others of us do it in an envelope with a check or maybe cash. A few people drop cash in. Um, but I want to pause and mark that all that we give back to God is God's and that we celebrate it and acknowledge that our giving is worship. So we make our offering back to God and cover it with this prayer. To you, Lord, belongs the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. All that is in the heavens and the earth is yours and of your own. We, we give, give you. you. Next week, we'll enter into communion at this point. And as you know, we have been on our fast from communion, a spiritual offering to God of laying it down and going without 
because of our isolation, because of this virus, but it's also an opportunity for us to offer that sacrifice back to God of putting it aside, though it is such a precious part, a sacrament, a holy space and act that we do to commune with each other, with God, and God with each of us and all of us. So I pause now to acknowledge we are fasting from our communion. So with that acknowledged, it's time that we move to closing. So let us pray this prayer together. Loving God, we thank you for our journey with you through this desert season. Though we're not again all together, we have hope. We continue to lift up those in places yet suffering and grieve with those who have lost loved ones here and abroad. We continue to lift up our prayers for those whose livelihoods are at risk or are already shattered. In the midst of this, protect and sustain us, each and all, and protect our community of faith that is St. Christopher's. Help us to know that we might be transformed and compelled in joy to love those around us who are yet to discover you, to heal yours who are yet wounded and to become more unified as a body together as we go forward. As we close our worship, we anticipate the end of our fast of communion, communion of shared life, communion in worship, communion in ministry, communion of worship and communion of Eucharist. Yet we remember, are grateful, and profess your faithfulness to us. In Jesus' name, we pray all this with great passion and earnestness. Amen and Alleluia. So I leave you with this blessing. Though the sea is so, so big and our boat so, so small, may you taste the tangible courage and joy and compelling unction to be the hope those with whom you share life need. May you do this with the assured blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that ends our worship and you're going about your day and hopefully it's sunny and lovely and beautiful and you have those you're going to celebrate Mother's Day with. A couple of fast notes. We all anticipate that if the PM doesn't say we're coming out of level three this week, it's going to be like telling a bunch of five-year-olds Christmas got canceled. So I fully anticipate we're going to be able to be together. Now, a lot of people have thoughts on what that should look like next week. I want you to know that we're thinking about that and working on that, that we're following what the government is saying and the health departments, and we are working and coordinating and dialoguing with the diocese on that so that we do this and do this well. We're also talking amongst ourselves as leaders with the wardens and service leaders and different specific people in our church on how we can maximize our gathering together, but yet remain safe. It's For those who will not be able to be with us, we're going to communicate, including getting word to you through the pastoral care network so that you have time to get to a place where you can watch. And I look forward to seeing you this week face to face. I really miss that. So from Suzanne and I, we send you our blessings and we send you with this dismissal. Go and make disciples. Go be light, salt, fragrance, hope, peace, purpose, and steadfast. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. We go in, in the, the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. See you soon.